What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very pumped to be talking about the global shamanic resurgence. We have Rack Razam, Niles Heckman, joining us on the show. What's up, guys? Hey, good to be here. Pleasure, Alan. Back for, I don't know, you guys are getting into the high numbers of rounds. I think this is four for Rack. This is two for Niles. <laughs> Where the, the minds keep going out to... Uh, evolve and grow and then they come back and share their experiences. Uh, Rack and Niles have been out uh, doing the second episode of Shamans of the Global Village. If you haven't seen the first episode yet of Shamans of the Global Village, pause this. Go and watch it. You can find the link in the bio below to the first episode. Pause this, watch it, and then your life will make more sense and <laughs> you have some context you have some context for what we're going to be talking about which is their second episode um, in the series they're both co-creators of shamans of the global village which is a documentary series exploring indigenous medicines and the global shamanic resurgence all right so um we can probably do a little bit of context uh here we've done so many um, shows together uh, now exploring spirituality, um, the nature of reality, why we're here. Um, and most recently, our show has taken um, a, a turn where uh, <clears throat> we've now been exploring uh, what is happening in modernity and how uh, many of the um, principles of indigeneity around the interconnectedness with each other and with our environment um, are, are lacking in modernity. And we've been talking about that so much on the show about how to, um, how to architect a social fabric that's more prosperous, um, especially with some of those principles. And so you guys, in a sense, are going and capturing some of these um, principles uh, in some of the most beautiful um, styles of, of 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 documentary series that I've that I've seen, it's really well artistically put together. So, um, give us a little bit of context um, regarding um, you know you two deciding to come together for this creationship around um, shamans of the global village mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the first episode, give me, give us a little taste of it, and then also we'll um, get into the second one. Yeah, creationship, good word. Well, I'll just initially say that the show is basically the union of our skill sets and kind of brings the best aspects of both of our skill sets together. You know, it's kind of the pinnacle of what we've done so far in terms of an artistic piece that we're very proud of. The pilot episode was made in 2016, we finished it? 15, well, we, we yeah. shot it in 2015. Yeah, so... I will just initially set it up by saying that typically a show is done by the entire season being completed with you know some level of proper budgets. This show is very independently made, so it's being done in a little bit of a different way, right, where we've made a pilot episode, and then essentially I kind of joke that hopefully we'll get to every other episode uh, more often than the band Tool makes an album. Hmm. But each episode is a very big undertaking. It's kind of like making a documentary feature, and documentary features can take years to make. So here we are about four years later having nearly completed a second episode because of other life requirements, right? So we've made essentially what is the equivalent of two feature documentary films on the subject, which we'll get into. But here comes the second one numerous years later that the gears are turning slowly, but they are constantly turning. And so we'll get into that. But do you want to give some insight as to the first episode and the background? Well, I guess I'll say it is an ambitious project. I, I think it's almost a bit like the Twelve Tasks of Hercules, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really. like it's like some some yeah. big thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a necessary thing because, um, as you're talking about modernity and indigenous sort of um, perspective and wisdom, there's an imbalance in the world that is out of touch with the wisdom of the ancestors, out of touch with the wisdom of the indigenous people, out of touch with the planet and ourselves. And a show like this um, is visioned to communicate the essence of what these cultures are doing, mediated through uh, plant medicines which come from nature and are all over the planet. And these people are the caretakers for, and they're caretakers not just for the medicines, but for the energy behind it, the relationship with the planet, how that mediates their communities. And so, as I've been noting with episode two, and we, we've envisaged you know, um, a series that's probably 12 or 13 episodes, which looks at um, 
entheogenic or psychedelic compounds uh, which have been used traditionally all over the world, like many of them are in Mexico, South America, uh, potentially Egypt, Iran, Australia, um, you know, Siberia. There's, there's all around the world, the planet secretes these substances and there's been relationships with them. So it is a big undertaking and an ambitious one. And I think it may take the rest of our lives, buddy, <laughs> um, at this rate. But, uh, but I think it's worth doing because there's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of diversity within each episode and you're seeing a lot of different capacities of the role of the healer or the, sh or the shaman as well. And conceptually, the way that the first episode is structured and the plan for future episodes is that each episode focuses on a specific medicine, plant or animal, and a specific practitioner who works with it. So we have kind of a primary, primary people we focus on per episode and then there's sometimes these secondary or tertiary guests with rack hosting. But yes, I mean, shamanism is as old as the hills, and it's not just about the medicines, but it's about the practitioners, the legacy, you know, and much to do with environmental issues, the rights of indigenous peoples, which we know are very much always under the boot of modern structures of commerce and imperialism and just the day-to-day -day ways that the West operates, or all of the East and West in terms of commodifying everything in the natural world. So... This show has, is a very full spectrum show and we learn a lot by doing it. You know, each episode is such a huge pilgrimage for us that it's yeah. a massive undertaking. Yeah. And each one is not only such a huge creative project, but it's such a life learning journey as we do each episode because we don't necessarily know how the next one is going to happen. We just let it kind of synchronistically come about with our other roles and responsibilities through life. So it's like, when are we going to get to the next episode? <laughs> how are we going to make it happen? How are we going to implement it? There's things that are always, when you're doing things independently, how are you going to have the financial resources to do it or how are you going to bring this into manifestation and we find that we very much are led as each episode comes into fruition and we've you know hopefully we'll continue to yes get a full series under our belt sometimes before we croak <laughs> yeah it's it's really cool also artistically seeing your forces come together to manifest this like you said that you guys have these key components that when pieced together can make shams of the global village exactly the work of art that it mm. is mm. i want to ask you both about this this is <clears throat> um we're going to get into much of like the ethos and the philosophy of what we're talking about as we explore these conversations. So I don't want to just ask a question about that specifically because it's going to come up naturally. But a question that I think um, could interest so many of us around this is um, how do you pick? Because there's so many indigenous cultures around the planet that have these sacred ritualistic relationships with plants and um, f for awakening, for healing, um, for all these different uh, methods. And you have on your website, you have a, your, like, your series roadmap. You know, you have, you listed all these countries, all these, how did you pick those? And you know, the first one was on the Sonoran Desert Toad, mm -hmm. right? So how do you guys pick, yeah, that one? How did you pick peyote for the second one? Yeah. I, I guess the shorthand is that they pick us, <laughs> right? Well um, in the sense that, uh, well, to backtrack a bit, you know, I first went down to the, the jungles and worked with ayahuasca in 2006 and in making a, writing a book about that experience and about what the West was engaging with, I started to see that there was a pattern that had been happening generationally where the West had been um, re-encountering uh, plant medicines and earth medicines which were caretaken by indigenous peoples. Um, and so there was a understanding that, you know, through research that all these different cultures around the world originally had an entheogenic or a psychoactive sacrament. And that's not just indigenous cultures per se. It also goes back to the Greeks with the, the rites of Eleusius and the Kaikion, their, their medicine. Um, the, the Romans who had something, um, the Judeo-Christianic religions had, um, you know, acacias and cannabis and the anointed, the, you know, themselves. Um, there's, there's, there's no war on drugs in prehistory, right? And so... In choosing which shows to do in this culture, in the modern uh, Western uh, paradigm, we have been constrained by legalities and we have upheld those legalities, right? So number one is like, are these indigenous medicines utilized in a country where they're legal? 
And then number two, it comes down to, well, uh, what is the medicine of that area? Like, for instance, we've been, we've done two episodes now in Mexico because culturally and geographically, Mexico down through Central and South America is where the repository of a lot of psychoactive medicines um, still exist. So there, you know, is the Buffo Alvarius Toad, which was episode one. There's um, the psilocybin magic mushrooms in Mexico. There's Salvia divinorum in Mexico. And there's peyote in Mexico, um, indigenous to Mexico. There's also other sacraments, but we didn't want to get top heavy with Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, finding countries where they were legal. And then it comes down to, in my almost 15 years of being in um, the Western shamanic culture, having worked with ayahuasca and the bufo toad in the last few years and um, encountered at conferences and online different people, it's getting the pulse of the global shamanic community. And in the global shamanic community contains both indigenous people and Westerners or, you know, first worlders who are engaging with the medicines, but it is a collective whole. And so within that, and this is maybe drilling down a bit much, but there's a lot of a diversity a lot of good practice and some bad practice. And so yeah. sometimes it's been a matter of reputations and of working with people that I personally know or that their reputations seem to be integral enough to want to represent them. And sometimes you find out things or things happen after you've worked with a practitioner. So we recognize that there is a duty of care to our viewers in who we present and for instance, uh, the the lead of episode one, uh, Dr. Octavio Redig, who is was and is very controversial in the Buffo Toad community, has become even more controversial, and people have died. And we acknowledge that people have died uh, in his care or lack of duty of care, regardless of his intentions, um, and that there is a delicate balance in uh, doing this work and representing it as media. So, we aim to document as documentarians we're not advising people do these substances we're not advising that they um, do have these experiences with the people that we show we're, we're trying to show warts and all the character of the person that works with these medicines and when i first went to peru almost 15 years ago i was told within the first few days there were three things essentially which curanderos or as we call them shamans have almost every single one of them issues with money with power and with women mm, right mm. and so it is hard in iquitos to find someone in peru one of the ayahuasca uh, hotspots to find someone that doesn't have a shadow or a skeleton in their closet yeah. and so we do vet and we do look at people and things will either that we don't know or things will come up in their practices and sometimes there is um there's two sides to the story. Sometimes there's, there's things that happen with the people that shamans work with, especially with Westerners, and there's lots of issues sometimes around um, a culture clash or different cultural expectations, um, or also around the role of, you know, this ego guru worship of the shaman in Western culture because of the absence or lack of that archetype in our culture and the need for healing. But there's often... Um, uh, a response to put these people on a pedestal. So we don't want to do that. We want to show warts and all. We want to show the pressures of the role, um, the duties of the role, you know, what that is like. And yet I will say that if, as this continues mm -hmm. and we do this work, uh, reputations change. So people should really um, look into the current status of the people they work with as we have tried to do. And also there's an element of documentarianism where it's, focused on the person to tell a story about the medicine and there's so much to learn culturally there's so much to learn about these spaces of spirituality that i would hope that the final product no matter what the reputation of the practitioner is still worthy as a documentary documentary yeah honesty transparency is key and it's true it's like indigenous cultures have problems just like modernity does you know there's nothing perfect about anybody just like every individual has their pros and cons and nobody's here that's not perfect that's perfect everybody's got things they're working on so it is interesting to see when we visit a tribe which in the second episode for example we're with the we're going to a specific part of mexico where they do an annual pilgrimage and just to be there is a special process but you see the way they live and how they have massive struggles and you know how they're very poor 
and they have things that they do well and other things that they do not well in the sense of how modern culture operates. Some of the things that we do are great and other things we need to learn a lot from indigenous tribal communities and vice versa. So that's a huge learning experience every step of the way and highlighting that the shamanic experience, specifically what is essentially the psychedelic experience in a shamanic container is very important for a part of getting to have some glimpse or insights into gnosis of experience and knowing that spiritual processes, spirituality is your life. So a shamanic experience can help give you, it's a tool for the larger spiritual process of your life. So just like Rack said, not putting these experiences up on a pedestal, but knowing that they are there as a way to help us find balance with nature and Gaia and divinity and cosmos and reunite with the greater ecology of things because one thing that indigenous tribes have typically done well and that we've seen during the processes of visiting them is that they have a much more beautiful balance and harmony with nature and how they live. And we know that much of Western society today and modernity is on a un very unsustainable path in a lot of ways. So these are all good things to highlight and each, each episode is a huge learning experience to say the least. And it's always good to highlight that nothing is perfect and we are always trying to make a piece of cinema that is as educational as possible, as transparent as possible, and um, hopefully as entertaining as possible as well. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's quite interesting that these uh, pick you and come through you, um, but also discussing these grand challenges of trying to take all of the beauty of um, the relationship of um, of different indigenous cultures with nature and with each other um, and figure out how to best share that with the world so that modernity itself can awaken more to the beauty of that and how to integrate it within itself. Um, meanwhile, the, um, these, these, these issues and um, anthropologists and archaeologists have for the longest time been trying to figure out how to not be extractive but be symbiotic yeah. with, um, yeah, in, the, in the relationships. And, um, and this is a very difficult thing when uh, colonialism is pushing in on, uh, on, on capitalizing on, on uh, extracting resources from these lands rather than treating them div like the divine things that they are, like they've been treated. And then also the commodification of this. We actually did a, a recent um, conversation with the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting with someone that's doing fashion anthropology. And this is a very wild um, statement, and I'll get back to the main um, stream of thought here. But the idea is that by working with different indigenous cultures around the world in the way that they communicate sacredness and divinity and spirituality through through fashion, through their clothing, through their sacred objects, these types of things. Mm -hmm. And then by, in a sense, allowing a little bit of the economic machinery into that so that they can share the sacredness with more people around the world can catalyze the awakening more. And that in itself is a very strange statement because it's allowing the economic machinery in to try and spread the memes of what the sacredness is uh, through, f like, yeah, through fashion and anthropology. I don't. That's a. That's just a statement that I thought was oh, quite really? interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know. Okay. It's a. It's a complicated. Um, it's a complicated discussion because of many reasons. Like, essentially, indigenous people are to a large degree broken or traumatized by the first world you know by the new world by the people that are essentially almost like their ancestors in some sense you know there's a um there's a south american um prophecy called the eagle and the condor and essentially it says after 500 years of colonial conquest by the spanish and the conquistadors that you know the country will come to a reunification of the eagle and the condor representing north america and south america and the mind and the heart um, but you've got to remember that um, all across the world, the old world was raped and pillaged and plundered and slaughtered yeah. en masse, right? So what is the mental driver of Western culture that is so damaged and so um, hurt that it goes out into the world and does 
repeats the victim mentality, right? It's been traumatized itself. Yeah. And this dichotomy between old world and new, left and right, we're seeing it in the world everywhere at the moment. I hope it's a um, precursor to a grand reunification, right? Likewise. Because, yeah. I mean, these loaded terms, we're all indigenous to planet Earth, Yes. right? Yes. And the labels we give and the separation we give are just that, they're just labels. So the indigenous people in their um, situation that the majority have found themselves even in the first world countries decimated and put under reservations and have held on to the sliver of their spirituality you know and their practices where they can and in larger countries where they're still in nature in the jungles and in the environments where they are they may be impoverished and surrounded by you know the capitalist rollout um, but they still have some connection to the land. And you've got to remember that to the indigenous people, what we think of as spirituality, it sounds like a hashtag. Yeah. It sounds like a buzzword. It's like, oh, let's get all spiritual and fuck. You know, oh, ayahuasca, it's trendy, or yeah. this and that. It's like, it's not necessarily even about the plant. The plant is an interface for a relationship with the land and spirit. And spirit is what sustains you. Yes. Not if you're just indigenous. Spirit is something which we all have. We're like spiritual beings having a human experience. But we've forgotten. So we're just as damaged as the indigenous people that our ancestors have decimated. And this is a process of species trauma I think we're all getting through. And, I mean, essentially, I don't know if it's the sole problem or the main driver... But capitalism is based on this idea of capital, which is based on the idea of land, which is based on ownership and possession. And money, if you look at the original etymology of all the linguistics in English of money, the riches come from the soil. It all goes back to Egypt, right? The banks are, you know, the devices on the side of the thing which would alternate the, the water flow. The levies they would put on things in, in tax terms are about water. It comes down to you can't eat money. You know, it comes down to the of nature and spirit is what the original currency is. And so spirituality isn't this faddish thing that capitalism can absorb. And yet capitalism is a virus which devours everything until you have a dead planet. So at the same time, plant medicines are being devoured by capitalism and they're being diluted. And for a large part, I would hope, and most people I know in the West who have felt the call of the medicines to be caretakers, to be providers, or to be facilitators, or if they even dare call themselves shamans, which is a loaded word in the global shamanic community, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a role and a responsibility, and to a large degree, they have good intentions. But there's a huge responsibility and we are seeing a dilution of the purity of shamanism and of the purity of the relationship of spirit and ceremony itself in Western shamanism. And so these are really huge issues with no easy answers. And as the medicalization of psychedelics juggernauts ahead and they cage God for relieving the anxiety of a capitalist culture which has battery farmed them into <sighs> depression and, and trying to kill them, um, there is a potential for the soma for the masses where these things can be absorbed by capitalism and yet there's also a potential where capitalism and the people within those structures are receiving a healing from these medicines while they're being commodified so it's a bit of a chase you know in both directions and I trust that there is a culmination to this process and the things will all be well but it doesn't mean the shit's not going to hit the fan as we go through this process. Yeah, and it seems like the shit hitting the fan is not this overnight zombie apocalypse thing. It's just a very, you know, the, the, the twilight of empire is obviously upon us. So we see a slow degradation back to some level of authenticity in what human beings are naturally designed to be like, which is somewhat indigenous, right? So people are terrified of this, you know, peak oil post, you know, assuming that global, Global capitalism assumes and demands a pl planet of infinite resources, which is, you know, you could argue materially we're on a planet of very finite resources. I think mentally we have aspects to bring a lot of things into manifestation that are very powerful, but it's, it's, it's very obvious to a lot of people that things must change. And like you've talked about on the show oftentimes, Alan, we need society up, up, upgrades and new operating systems and ways of doing things. So 
many of those things aren't just endless tech thinking that it will save us. It's just more getting back to authentic ways of being and living in the world. And indigenous peoples have constantly struggled with this, but it's, it's beautiful to see that at the same time, their spirit is often not broken, right? Like Rack had said. So it, it's very beautiful to see that getting back to ways that are more authentic, which definitely means that we might have to chop wood and carry water a bit more in the future, isn't necessarily this awful thing, right? It's like we can find a way of balancing commerce, you know, with ways of being decentralized and not as hierarchical. And it's not going to be the dynamic where a shaman, you know, says that I can't pay my bills with a feather and a stone, but there is ways to do to continue forward in, a, in, in ways that are much more in balance and harmony with nature, right? And I think a lot of these things, we're at the point now with what's going on environmentally and ec ecologically that nature will force us to do these things, mm. which seems scary and seems uh, overwhelming, but oftentimes it'll just lead us to more authentic ways of being, right? And it'll, it's, it's a slow process. So that's why it's good to, to have community and to have uh, not, not fear. You know, fear is the mind killer, as Frank Herbert said. So to realize that so much of this is the larger spiritual process, which is spirituality is truth. Spiritual, spirituality is your life. So just look to somebody's life to see how they're doing in their spirituality and just look how the society is doing as a whole in their spirituality, which yes, in the modern world, a lot of people's lives are a mess. So the society and the culture is a mess. But as each node on the network does things to work on bettering themselves, and we could talk about the whole reason and why that you would do that. but you can see how we'll get back to some of these more authentic ways of living more spiritually in harmony with nature. I always bring it back to nature, the yes. ultimate spiritual teaching. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, mm. So the more that I embark on the depths of this spiritual journey that, that this one is on, um, that the more it feels as though this is perfect, that um, this reality is um, perfect in the sense of it being um, a perfect, constant harmonization and flux between uh, the classical yin and yang of good and bad, of light and dark, of it's whatever you want to call it, and that the extreme, um, the ex extremity of the um, younger brother going out into metropolises and um, having all of the tinkering with innovation, but also the issues that are also arising from that. Meanwhile, the older brother is um, still in the depth of interconnectedness with nature and the land in its most sacred um, ways. That in itself is that same perfect balance right there. And that um, when we say things like it's out of balance, um, it's a, we agree with that statement because we're like, that's why you're doing the global shamanic resurgence documenting this and trying to share it with the world to catalyze the awakening of this good side of, of this resurgence. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, it's as though there's on this, on this evil side that's constantly going up with the good is that there's um, uh, better and better uh, propagators of old archaic corrupt codes that are trying to manipulate and um, and own more and choke more the nature, choke more the spirit, and uh, that those two things being in this ascent, ascent together, um, pressed up against one another, seems like why it's such a, a perfect creation. Um, I'll hmm. get to another question after that, but how do you guys feel about, about that? I like it, Ellen. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I got a little really? bit of Rack's uh, approval. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's, the, it's this idea about sound bites and, and again, and, and like the hashtag thing. It's like spirituality isn't necessarily what you think it is, you know, and good and evil aren't necessarily what you think it is. And this polarity of the way we see the world, you know, we're so stuck in duality. 
and we've forgotten the way right so we're saying technology or nature nature's a technology it's a vegetal technology she's secreted she created us a biological technology <laughs> consciousness is a technology i mean all the labels that are just illusory things that create fragmentation and separation and so what is the value of shamanism right why are we doing this show what is the global shamanic resurgence what is a shaman right we created that term the west created that term it comes from mm -hmm. siberian um medicine work uh from the salmon in their language and western anthropologist merce eliad in his classic book shamanism in the 1950s um he defines the role of the shaman as a, a technician of ecstasy <laughs> right and again the the cultural drift of what the words means ecstasy originally from the greek ecstasis means like communion with god uh, right it's that yeah. it's that powerful it's that pure it, the ecstasy the joy yeah. of discovering your spiritual nature is that you're not separate you're not who and what you thought you are you're an emanation of the godhead having a human experience right yeah. and these labels and these words they're like maps leading us back to truths which we have forgotten and so the shaman is also in potentially western um interpretation a healer a priest a traveler between the worlds a mediator of the invisible energies all around and he he or she and many cultures had female medicine women and still do um was a mediator of energy because they understood that humans are not separate right indigenous people born in nature didn't live in a cubicle shut off from air and sunlight yeah. most of their lives so their dna atrophied you know it's like they were embedded within an ecosystem with multiple life forms multiple energies which extended out into the the energetic or the astral and they had to mediate those energies for the health and survival of of their communities so number one the shaman was in charge of the health of their communities right yeah. and so as part of that um the plant medicines are really important but there's also so many other roles often shamans would be village elders or chieftains or the personal politics that all people have within them you know that affects it we I'm just waiting for someone to create an app talking about technology that can visualize the energetic ripples of when this person says to that person and they get angry and then they go and say to that person and pass it on yeah. and if you could visualize you know yes. there's those visualizations yes. to see on yes. youtube yes. of um internet signals and like the 5g radiation yeah. and stuff and it's like rainbow things if we could visual visualize the emotional impact we have on everyone around us yes. even if we live in our box and withdraw yes. it's all connected but the big picture is the west has forgotten through its trauma through its disconnection through its um focalization on you know this outcome on everything that's out here it doesn't look back here anymore it doesn't connect to the feeling and so the idea of technologies aren't good or bad right consciousness is not good or bad it's what you do with it so an egoic western mind focused on survival and out here and playing the game of life seeing it as separate from themselves seeing where to climb who to kill how to take out how to look after me 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 has created the planetary emergency we now find ourselves in which is still perfect and still going according to some higher unification plan wow so the technologies you were mentioning aren't necessarily wrong but the intention yeah. unless as modern humans we can deeply drink from the well of remembrance mm -hmm. and remember who we are what we are why we're here then how can we go out there and do anything that isn't going to fuck up everything mm -hmm. know thyself yeah and, the, and shamans you know through all time were just the medicine people of the village right and that's mentally not necessarily physically right like we have physical doctors of today but we have a lot of mental illness in our society and the shamans could help with that so you talk about societies that have lost their way i mean we don't have any initiation into adulthood in the modern world with the shamanic experience where indigenous cultures would typically have a young sprout go off and do some pilgrimage and have some experience whether or not there was a sacrament involved or not that initiated them into adulthood that brought in that ecological balance with themselves and the larger larger greater ecology of things so that's what a lot of 
people in the Western world or in, in the modern world, I mean, obviously you look at parts of the East, which the cities are firing on all cylinders and being even more destructive in some ways than parts of the West. It's not just a West thing. It's a modern modernity thing yeah. that finding ways to reach maturity in adulthood is is tough. And that can only be done through experience. It can only be done through harmony with the way that you find processes and live more authentically and it's not done through sitting in your cubicle and the nine to five you've talked about the bottom line and the rat race a lot in your material alan and yeah everybody's realizing that there's there's so much more to life than that and so much of what you spoke of in your metaphor of the two brothers is just about yes this polarization that we see just on such full spectrum firing on all cylinders now with politics and everything and that what rack speaks of is this maturity through experience and initiation into unity of not binary, but, you know, non-binary, right? Just yeah. this, this unity of one realizing what we are is more that we are all one, which sounds like a very wooey metaphysical thing. And what, do you, what does that really mean when we boil it down, the oneness of everybody, is that we are all collectively having the same experience. And we could think of much of what we're doing as just, you know, this dream of life and how do we learn from this polarization as a teaching tool. Maybe life is just to teach us about all these things that we do well and that we have to take away and, and when this mortal coil wraps up, be like, what did you learn from this crazy wild life of not to be in fear, but to just think of, wow, what a ride, what an amazing ride this life was. So the point of all this is just, just to say that the show is one of our ways that Rack and I hopefully can do our ever so slight part in highlighting some of these larger overarching, overarching brush strokes but then also showing to people what some of these indigenous ceremonies are like and some of these initiatory processes. You know, what's the importance of the journey, the sacraments, the pilgrimages, and the ceremonies, which specifically the second episode really highlights as we go through this earth, air, fire, water process yes, in the episode yes. of these specific ceremonies <clears throat> yes. and the importance of them and why they're done in the context with the medicine, in the ceremonies, with the tribe, with the village, with the unity of the whole community. Perfect um, segue into this. So... <clears throat> We've um, talked now so much. Actually, um, right prior to that, I just want to say because there's another thing that we've been talking about on the program quite, quite a bit recently, and it spoke to this idea of being able to visualize the energetics, especially between like humans. And um, one thing that's very interesting is this idea of being able to um, to have a of, of a, a biometric measurement of a state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if uh, mm -hmm. if we were to take the state of, of like a Dalai Lama or something and their biometric state of consciousness and catalog that as deeply interconnected or unconditional love, um, the drops in the ocean, uh, and then try and like analyze the biometric state of like a, like Xi Jinping or Donald Trump or uh, Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg. And you just really just start like being just blatant like there's 2500 billionaires submit them all into the biometric consciousness analysis and see how many of them need little tiny nudges towards these states of interconnectedness mm -hmm. um and so we've been talking about that quite a bit on the program and then um you know we're using these words and this kind of is another great segue into what i wanted to mention off of what you just said which is that if you take um, these words of ecstasis or these words of yoga, which we have to remind people all the time means union in Sanskrit, union with the one. And you can take whatever path you want to take, right? There's 8 billion of us that have 8 billion unique communions that are like snowflakes or instruments being played in the symphony that then commune with that that there are all of these different modalities in terms of communion, in terms of, and, and so um, part of what this question that I wanna, that I wanna ask is, is that the modalities are, there's so many of them. For thousands of years, this practice of meditation, for thousands of years, this practice of, of sacred plant medicines and our interactions with them. There's so many different modalities. <clears throat> so, question being in episode one and in episode two it seems like in episode two there's so much of a like a really deeper highlight with um these four elements T walk us through the process of the communion that people are having because mm -hmm. maybe it is that the more that we talk about our own unique communions with the one as well as sharing our stories um sharing these practices of indigenous cultures around the world of the communions that we can then excite more people to care about their own processes of communion hmm. yeah. so 
you know, we we're saying how we choose these uh, these episodes, and number two chose us. It fell into our lap of um, a group of modern um, Mexican spiritual seekers who live in LA, who are also media makers, who had seen and liked episode one that invited us to go down to Mexico this March, and that is the season when the Huichol people of Mexico, who are one of the, the oldest tribes in Mesoamerica that weren't you know, conquered or um, culturally sort of um, decimated by moder modernity, um, who live in the, the remote mountain ranges, and they have a relationship with what they call hickory and what we call in, um, in the West peyote which is, um, you know, in the cactus family, it contains mescaline and other um, alkaloids, um, and is a profoundly visionary experience. But yet again, that's just the outside wrapper to describe it. So the medicine person of the witch hole is called a marakame, usually a man. Um, it's usually passed down through the lineage and there can be multiple of them. There's um, dozens and dozens of Marikame villages in the area they still live and there's um, hundreds and hundreds of Marikames. So this is a community where shamanism is still vibrant and alive and again isn't just about this one plant, it's about that they're part of that maintenance and reciprocal energetic exchange keeping the community healthy and in, in well-being. So we were invited down in March because uh, the witch I'll go on a pilgrimage, you know, which in the Judeo-Christianic um, terminology, really a pilgrim is a seeker. It's a seeker that's in search of knowledge or connection or a spiritual outcome um, and it has a religious connotation right it's not just a holiday it's not just drug tourism as vice would probably call it right this is um, an indigenous um, ceremony and it's not just about the peak experience so for me this was the big difference from episode one uh, in the sense that the Marikame Don, um, Don Jose Ramirez, who is a very well-respected uh, chieftain and Marikame shaman in his community, he's in his uh, mid-60s and he's been working at this since he was about 10. Wow. Um, again, these cultures which have an intergenerational legacy of working with the medicines don't see them as evil or bad or drugs. It's relationship. It's like you're going to breathe air, you're going to, you know, like get out there and swim. Yeah. You, you have a relationship with the elements and, and with nature. Yeah. So Don Jose was legendary. He's, he's, there's been other documentaries made about him. Um, but as an archetypal representation of the Marikame medicine man, what the big difference was with this episode was really about the pilgrimage and about the re-sacralization. We had a little tribe of men, women and children. There was probably about... 50 or 60 of us and we'll travel on these little mini buses and cars and we went from um, uh, San Luis Potosi and Zacatecas the capital city where we all met and we would just travel out and we did not sleep right and this is no this not, is no you know, not not, well, little, because here's, yeah. here's the thing is wow. that is that we had a very short amount of time and the multiple Marikames from their villages in the mountains who travel these hundreds of kilometers on the pilgrimage go there both to reenact the original meeting and there's a lot of cosmology here where they have um, representations of the peyote as a spirit as the blue deer um, and that originally the original um, tribes person had found and met and taken peyote and that kept a continuity of the legends and the mythology but a lot of the um, journey was about well, all of the journey was essentially about tracing the route of the sacred sites on the road to Wirakuta. And Wirakuta is the holy of holiest. It's like nature's desert Vatican for them. No structures per se, wow. but it's where the peyote is, in, is indigenous to wow. and where it grows in quantities. Now, we've got to warn that peyote is an endangered plant medicine and sacrament and, and um, mm. vegetal substance, um, partially because of climate change and of um, outside factors, but also partially because of Western um, interference. And that, you know, it takes about seven or eight years for a peyote pup or a bud to grow into full blossom. And it can take multiple peyote um, buds to get a, a crescendo of the entheogenic visionary experience. So, you know, the West has known about this for decades, but the, the um, drain or the pressure put on the ecology and the cultivation of peyote is a big issue that we want to talk about in the documentary. And it um, is a big issue 
here and in, in North America where it grows in Texas and other regional states around there as well. Does so, it grow anywhere else in the world? Well? Uh, it's been transplanted, but not in, it's a desert bearing, you know, um, uh, cactus. Um, there's efforts underway to sort of with multiple plants that are endangered because because of both the western demographics drain on resources ayahuasca is the same there's a whole movement to repopulate ayahuasca same with the bufo toad from episode one for fair trade toad yeah. a peyote has been endangered for decades and there's not enough for even the indians you know for the mesoamericans so um the whole tribe came with us all these people men women and children and they prayed right it's not just let's go to a, a yes. weekend ceremony where this visiting shaman is doing his thing. It's like there was hardship, yes. there was sacrifice, yes. there was ritual, there was tradition, there, there was relentless um, ritual sacralization of what needed to be done at each site. And the reason for that is the Makarames believe that the earth is alive. And when I say alive, obviously it births certain life, but it's intelligently alive. It is the great being or part of the even greater being. And that great being has a reciprocal relationship with all its creatures, which must be maintained, just like the Marakames maintain the health of the well-being of their community, so too they're maintaining the well-being of the Earth community and how humans interface with the other species in the Earth itself. This is not a metaphor. I, th I think Terence McKenna <laughs> might have said, the earth is alive yeah. and we're in relationship with it and it's not a healthy one at the moment. So some of the sacred sites that we saw, you know, where, for instance, the, the holy springs where they believe when the, the great floods resided thousands of years ago and life first reflourished, surrounded by fences in the backyard of suburban St. Louis Potosi, and they've got cultural issues about getting access to their sacred sites because of capitalism buying up the land and other as associated features, that there was really this ragtag, poor, um, in a sense, pure people mm -hmm. that were on their old, uh, annual pilgrimage to gather as much peyote as they could to take it back to the rest of the village and their tribes in the mountains to do them the entire year. And on the way, we stopped at all these sites, relentlessly sacralizing and giving thanks and blessing with water and with prayers and with feather and with live animal sacrifice. Um, wow. Because blood is the great carrier blood is you know the great conductor of life of spirit so there are ancient traditions that had to yes, be maintained yes. and don jose ramirez's um dedication to the rituals was really heart opening and to go on that pilgrimage over multiple days to endure to give it up to be present with it that is what was needed to approach taking the peyote with respect and permission right. in the final legs it wasn't just you go to this weekend ceremony there was this pilgrimage there was this purification and there was this sacrifice and we shy away from sacrifice yeah. it's too hard it hurts yeah. let's put nets up around our trampolines let's put helmets on let's protect ourselves from the wind and the sun and the earth and the element of danger which makes you feel alive right it's like we're molly coddled in our society and it's like there's no safety net out there on the edge with shamanism and that's how and why you can encounter something real within yourself that you're connected to that is also outside of yourself and, hope. and what you speak to ellen with the elements you know like we've obviously talked extensively about commodifying the elements and how that's completely unsustainable with you know selling corporate water bottles or buying up land and especially over somebody's sacred site or burning the Amazon over some indigenous tribes like place that they've had for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, that stuff is not going to last. But in terms of the elements energetically, I mean, visiting these sites for the earth, the air, the water, and the fire, these have deep, you know, principles within the magic of practice, right? And so it's, it's important to realize that magically and spiritually, what you mentioned in your question is so much people realize all of these various modalities of spirituality are turning people inward. And when you turn inward, you realize you start to have these chrysanthemum blossomings about realizing these things within you. It's so much about your, your state of mind and your way of being and your, the way that you harmonize with others, yourself, your inner self, your higher self, and the community as a whole, which is the Gaian ecosystem, which the tribe, yes, very 
wisely says is a living entity, a wiser creature. So these elements are really highlighted through this pilgrimage, which is always sacrifice. Because think of in your life how many times you've been, you've done something that's struggle and difficulty and how much that's led to great reward, right? So it's like there's some old alchemical mm -hmm. quote that says like the oldest forests and the deepest, the tallest mountains and the deepest deserts as climbing a mountain is obviously like an allegory for this spiritual path. So that's the struggle and difficulty. And it is, it is making this thing, like as Rack said, we did it in about three days of shooting, which is very, very tough. It's a very tight wow. schedule and it was very, that alone is tough. And then doing this pilgrimage in a very beautiful landscape, Weracuda. Weracuda is amazing. It's like, a, it is a desert, but it's like a cactus jungle <laughs> where you think like desert means you're on this like just dead rock of moonscape, but it, it was really actually quite lush and beautiful. And the peyote is a beautiful yeah. little access doorway to this inner experience it looks like a little beautiful muffin and it is a living yeah. entity it's a beautiful little almost alien entity yeah, yeah. and that's why like we're wearing these wristbands that show mm. some aspect it depends on people's inner experiences how you are when you have an experience of ever so slight gnosis and gnosis mm -hmm. is just a knowing that something is the case mm -hmm. my experience was very visible and visual and rack and i are wearing these wristbands which the tribe makes as a way to through their own creative art give a little bit of insight as to what some people oftentimes experience. Mm. But um, it's, it's our struggle with the show is always like, how do we show these inner experiences, which to some extent can never be done lensed externally. But my goal as a documentarian and Rack's goal as, you know, my co-collaborator is to always try and deliver the best product possible in terms of the show and yes, the commerce of day-to-day -day modernity, which we do sell the episodes but also combine beauty with wisdom. You know, combine some of these wisdom aspects that we've talked about during this conversation with what is beautiful. Show it in a beautiful way because beauty has this beautiful relationship with truth. You know, if you go and look at a Rembrandt painting, you know there's some truth in that thing, right? Uh, uh, there was a Manly P. Hall quote that once said something to the extent of like, all unreal things are ugly and all true things are beautiful. And, you know, I'd like to publicly just, again, just um, acknowledge the beauty of your cinematography and direction, the ability to capture. Oh, so cool. when you're in nature, yeah. there's this thing, and, you know, modern humanity live in cities. Over 50% of people in the world now live in cities. And, you know, they're not nature, right? It's like culture is a cargo cult that is like blossomed <laughs> like a candida virus or something within nature and it's separated it drains all resources from the periphery to the center of where it, and it it stays in its little boxes and it tries to control its relationship with nature when we were out in Wirakuda, which is the holy of holiest lands as Nell said very beautiful in its desolate aridness you start to pick up a sense after days there uh, of the shape of of things of the fact that there are energetic um, rhythms, you know, and like you'll see the sunrise and the beauty and you'll feel the wind and you'll see the, the birds and the animals wake with the sun, the sun and yeah. you realize, oh, yeah. the energy exchange of the sun and the light and the heat yes. and the day. And, yes. and it, it's like seeing the great being wake up. Yes. And then there are these moments when, you know, there'll be just these astounding synchronicities where a cloud will part and sun will come through or, mm -hmm. you know, a flock of birds will all turn left all at once, even though they're like this group entity that's one being and who's leading. and and there's these rhythms within rhythms where I really start to see the contours of the great being, right? Of, of, of what, yeah. why they pray to nature, why they resacralize, why they reconnect. Yeah. Because you can't be separate unless you choose. And even then you're not really separate. <laughs> you're just not tuning in. But there's, there's an energetic yeah, yeah. Yeah. reciprocal relationship. I mean, we haven't even mentioned, you know, the sixth great species extinction and the planetary emergency that has hit the fan everywhere, right? And so the thing is, the planet won't die, but things are hitting the fan. The carbon dioxide, the methane release, the forest fires burning, the bushfires, the flooding, the extreme weather. The coral things, bleaching. In your the coral bleaching. Like, everything is dying off. And it's, it's like we're ignoring it. We're ignoring it because we've ignored nature. We just like, where do we get the refill from? And it's like, you know, it's like, okay, the living being that we are, and when we say embedded in, these words don't do it justice, right? It's like we're in the mother. We're in this holy, <laughs> sacred creature, which is the womb yeah. of life. Yeah. And we're hiding away in our concrete little 
boxes, right? Draining all the things looking at Netflix and creating a virtual world where we can be more protected. It's not going to end well. So I just want to bring it back to this idea. What is shamanism? Why do we do what we do? Why do we document this? Why is this important, right? And I'm not saying you have to go off and take peyote. And if you do, do it with the indigenous people and their permission because there's not enough to go and, around. And the harvesting of the medicine. And, and the, you know, but... To have an experience through whatever modality, whether that's breath work, whether that's rebirthing, whether that's plant or, or animal psychoactive medicines, whether that's tantra or lovemaking, whatever tunes you in to your deeper being reconnects you to the web of life. And then you can give and receive and you can become a whole human being because the modern human is atrophied. It is bastardized. It is like this zombie really, you know, racing towards the apocalyptic cliff. And it's not good. It's not healthy. And that's why the earth is in transformation and upheaval. It's purging the human virus because the children have lost their way. And these indigenous cultures who aren't the noble savages, we're not trying to lionize and grandize them into these pure beings. They have their own shit and their own politics and their own egos. But to a degree, from whatever sliver of a degree, they yeah. remember the spiritual connection, yes. not just as a lifestyle, but mediated potentially through their medicine men and women as the West is relearning. They can navigate the shitstorm of modern culture. Yeah. Are you yeah. saying we can't buy rainforests on Amazon.com, right? <laughs> It, it's it's true. I mean, it's such a beautiful way to say it that navigating how seeing what they do well is definitely a teaching tool. And everything is a teaching tool. Everything's a learning experience. So inward processes are a great way for you to have the best insight as to what is truth for you and for the larger collective as a whole. Right. And that's what is so key. I mean, this through all that we've talked about in this conversation, much of which sounds very interesting, some of which sounds kind of bleak, but there's a lot of positive things to be gained by people turning inward and not ignoring things or not becoming very egotistical, but seeing that inward processes are kind of the forward escape, yeah, the forward yeah. progress, the forward, the uh, forward and upwardness. May, just a, a moment. Um, <clears throat> as uh, you have now uh, documented um, the process of communing with the one with nature is a process of of, of deep reciprocity um, there's ritual throughout um, that is <clears throat> deeply uh, oriented about communing with nature in so many different variables when you look at a uh, a, br a brief landscape, take out the phone, selfie, mm -hmm. aka a selfish, take on, and then leave, um, that in itself is cancer compared to uh, arriving and seeing the depth that you were describing where you can actually experience the sunrise and the awakening of the conscious being the plants the animals in that area um, for that day and seeing when you look for an extended period of time at a landscape you no longer just uh, see it you feel it even beyond feeling it becoming it and you also just you there's way more nuance that is seen um over time than if you look at it for just a couple seconds. This process of going and stopping over and over again along this path towards, um, towards the, the, the harvesting of the sacred uh, plant medicine and then the, the process of, of going on the, these, these spiritual journeys, there's something that deeply reminds me, we've talked about this so many times, Niles Rack, of going inward and this process of knowing yourself and having these these experiences can be so uh simple they do not need um such great complexities of needing to go to uh 10-day silent sittings or to go to the um 
the locations where you can uh, take on these plant medicines. It can be as simple as, we've mentioned this on the show so much that to leverage the breath as the divine tool that it is that communes you, when the sip of water comes and we take it in to realize the divinity within that, the bite of food, the divinity within that, the powered by the sun, which then gives you power. All of these tiny things that happen throughout your day that you do on a daily basis, um, to have the deeper amounts of gratitude and the deeper amounts of communion through just those tiniest micro pieces um, catalyze the small butterfly effects. When you, when you also pause before you eat a meal with someone and just pause it, look at them in the eyes and take the time to bless the fact that you are sharing a meal together and to bless that food. Before you take that sip of water with someone, say that it's so beautiful that this water is nourishing us right now. And those tiny little things um, can also catalyze that deep um, inward uh, journey that we need to build to architect that social fabric that enables prosperity mm -hmm. um, that, that is so healing and regenerative. Um, well, so, if I yeah, could speak, yeah. speak yes. to that, Alan, you just very eloquently, I don't know if you consciously did it or unconsciously did it, you just talked about four things, which are four alchemical elements that we talked about that you, what do you do? You bring them into your body, right? So those are, mm -hmm. there's a little hint right there that your body is the alchemical vessel. And we talk about these things in terms of like, what is the point of all this? It's yes, it's this journey of finding a beautiful balance and health with, of body, mind, and spirit. And then also finding a, a way that you can essentially use your mind in a way positively, realizing so much is mind-based, using your heart in another beautiful way because ultimate reality, you don't know until you can actually feel it. And a lot of these shamanic experiences allow you to feel reality, what is actually real and not just five cents material reality, which is only part of the puzzle. And then how do you pursue your true will in life? Like, what are you doing with your life? And what are these, how are you integrating these experiences into your own source code? to then live your life in the most authentic way possible through your own ventures and how you choose to spend like a commodity your time, right? So that's what this show is part of our way of using our time in a way to help disseminate the information just like you do with this show, right? And so that kind of is a, that's part of our own process spiritually and alchemically of how we better ourselves through the process. We're process oriented in this show. <laughs> we're not goal oriented, we're process oriented. Do you have any thoughts on that last bit as well? Probably. Um, <laughs> he usually does. <laughs> I just wanted to backtrack a, a few, yes. a few hop skipping thoughts there. So you know, the great bard Terence McKenna had some. Well, there's, there's so many quotes, but he has this little riff. It says, "Plan, plant, planet." Right? It's in the language. Right? That there's a plan. You know, that's underway involving the plants as part of the planet, right? And then we're all part of it. And it's even been said that, you know, the plants invented the humans or assisted in the biospheric sort of evolution yeah, sure. of the plants to carry the seeds, to propagate the plants, to breathe out the carbon dioxide, which they need in the reciprocal relationship. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we're scared to look at the, the symbiosis of nature because yeah. it would mean that, oh, fuck, we're in something. We're not the <laughs> dominion conquerors of yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. It's like we're in a living organism and that's totally changes the paradigm. And um, Terence also said that basically at times of, you know, great societal unrest, which happen in the rise and fall of civilizations, like clockwork, right? Yeah. Because there are larger rhythms of time. And within that, it's like cultures rise and fall, like in this sort of like um, species Petri dish, right? There's, there's this thing which happens, there's this dissemination, there's this growth phase, and then there's a, a phase where it starts to decay and starts to die, and then there's another cycle. <laughs> and so at times when the cycle goes the pendulum swings backward, we start to fear, we start to contract, and we start to look back to the times when things made sense, right? So at the moment we're seeing that in the world is this return of authoritarian father figure leaders who are conservative and, you know, insular and are withdrawing from the global cooperative sort of web. Um, but it goes back even further than that. 
it goes back beyond patriarchy essentially to the utopian edens we had in pre-civilization it goes back to what terence called the archaic revival the archaic meaning how did we survive for potentially up to one million years in different hominid forms how did we flourish how have we survived five great species extinctions which modern science says have plagued the world before and we've had global warmings before look into those great species extinctions naturally occurring global warmings which raise the carbon dioxide i think it was the fourth or the fifth uh, extinction we did that there's not always meteorites or asteroids which do it right essentially there are rhythms within the living Gaian organism we, we're in and civilizations rise and fall and when we go back looking for stability looking for center looking for meaning it always involves nature because we remember again the real story of what we're embedded in what we're part of and Niall said it before, it's not just that these words, I almost feel sorry that they're not enough to communicate. These are yeah. maps, but it's about the feeling. Yeah. It's like I could say to you the word, I'm in love, right? Yeah. And it sounds nice, and it might trigger your, you know, responses energetically of your own feelings yeah. of love. And all of a sudden you start to feel, you start to sensitize, you start to come back into the somatic experience mm. of the spiritual being in a body, in the temple, as Niall said, in the vessel, which is being created by nature to hold its divine spark, right? And modern humans, and this is my riff from ages ago, I call it they have species PTSD. Yeah. We, you know, we do because we are not just blinkered, we have armoring, we have this, um, desensitized nature where we don't go out into nature we're scared of nature and we've been pillaging it for hundreds of years since the industrial revolution in the the wave of the time cycle and now it's coming back to a different thing and so the reason why these experiences whether they're psychedelics from a lab or you know plant or animal based um, entheogens psychoactives um, can help people at this time of great planetary emergency it's not because you see pretty pictures or visions or that it's hallucinations or escapism it's an escape hatch back to reality right to the original state of being which is feeling that there is no separation yes. between you and the air and the sky and the sun and the lake and the fish and the animals yes. the lakota indians call this metakwiasan you know all my relations all these different cultures around the world have a concept that they feel not just think of how everything is interrelated in the unified field in the web of, of life and we're starting to re-get that through modern science and quantum stuff and the understandings of biology and you know the way it all, all threads together but we're not feeling it yet yeah, yeah. you know yeah. and so these substances have the potential to open your heart not just your mind and that's why there's not about psychedelics entheogens mean to awaken the divine within mm -hmm. right and i i believe that they are necessary and important and secreted by the planet herself to mediate the species consciousness and to bring us back into right relationship with the planet as many other speakers have said too. It's like, it's a growing body of thought. My last little riff I want to say on this little bit of the subject, I which is juicy. This. Yes. <laughs> There's a, a, a beautiful guy in the UK, um, Sam Gandhi, he's a, a PhD. He works with the Beckley um, Institute that's doing a lot of the legal scientific research with psychedelics. I've just done a DMT study on what's happening in the brain, MRIs, EEG, um, thinking it's like near lucid dreaming, all this type of stuff. His speciality is ecodelics, is the idea of psychedelics or entheogens, these psychoactive substances, as not just modulators of consciousness, but of relationship, of relationship with ourselves, with each other and yes. nature. Yes. And if you take an entheogenic a psychoactive substance in nature in the right set and setting preferably with a sitter or a guide you know someone's looking after you you remember the wonderment of all of creation or the potential is there for you to remember yes, yeah. so at the moment there is this um very pronounced and a um, lot of momentum around the medicalization of psychedelics which i support there's also a, a lot of commodification and, and capitalist interest in the profit margins around the commodification of psychedelics in modern psychotherapy which i do not necessarily support and there is very little conversation around 
the spiritual nature and potential of these substances. So all the attention or a lot of the attention is going towards people with anxiety, stress and PTSD, which is probably like 70 to 80 percent of the general populace in Western countries because it's a battery farm that's designed to drain all our energy until we die. Right. Anyway, um, if you take these substances in an environment, it's not it's, they're not just for if you have something wrong, you don't have to be sick to take these substances, although there is an element of spiritual disconnection that even well humans are probably not as connected in a spiritual nature as, as we could be, that if you do these things in nature, and Sam Gandhi's hypothesis and PhD is all about reconnecting in a spiritual sense, like there's, he's a, he's a, I forget the Japanese term, it's like Shinzu or something, it's like forest bathing, where without a psychoactive, you can go into nature and just be, and you are getting fed yeah. the oxygen from the plants and the trees, the sunlight, the wind, the air, the insects, there's energetic reciprocal exchanges happening all the time, which your DNA picks up on and starts to come alive to, yeah. and you breathe deeply the gift of life. life. And if you do that with a psychoactive sacrament, mm. right, it's not recreational, it's remembering remembering the sacred yes. and if you do that in nature there's been a study done on this potential of these substances to renew the sacred contract in a sense to renew um, or release the armoring to make people whole again to remember the sacred and I would love to see more of um, an awareness around this potential I see that the psychedelic community has evolved from taking the substances, serving the substances. There is a whole movement of integrationalist and um, people that meet to uh, share their experiences and have support networks for each other integrating afterwards. Go out to the forest together when the spring comes, right? I'm not suggesting you do anything illegal, but if you were to do it en masse, like a tribe, yeah. like a band of brothers and sisters in a controlled set and setting in nature and just be with it, yes. then that is the archaic renewal right yes. that is the potential you don't have to be sick and traumatized and on ptsd and six thousand dollars for three mdma sessions with your therapist That's to right. go out in a controlled environment nature and feel the love of being alive again and in the shamanic experience in a guided set and setting with a facilitator or a medicine person that is what they do they hold a ceremony they re-sacralize and in that peak experience of the entheogenic bliss potentially there may be healing there may be trauma release but if you don't have that or the 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 opposite of trauma is connection it's held it's loved and that that is what is needed by so many people so i see the the shamanic resurgence as this unification of old and new east and west and of heart and mind you know of coming together into this remembrance of who and what we really are guided by the elders and guided by the connection with the tribal indigenous cult cultures guided by the planetary intelligence which secretes these substances which coincidentally fit our neural structure and help us to remember it's like we're meant to do this <laughs> Mm -hmm. Things are happening the way they are in an intended way. Seems like a divine plan. Yes. I think we have a lot of teaching tools within nature. I just was speaking about the sun and moon and the balance of the feminine and the masculine and how these are obvious teaching tools to man. And nature shows us so much about rac what RAC has just illustrated. You know, it's such a teaching tool, nature. And experiences in it are endlessly priceless. And especially when you get older and you realize that you'd much rather go out on a walk with your dog rather than watching the, you know, bread and circuses of the football match or something. It's like these experiences with a specific sacrament whether or not you've, you're, exper you're in nature with them or not are just kind of like another leveling up of that experience right and doing them in kind of specific ways in a sacred context with the tribe rarely helps gives you insights and they can be very life-changing insights so these life-changing processes of mind heart connection i mean that's your that's your empowerment as an individual there full spectrum human full spectrum human but you know that's what the show tries to highlight so we encourage folks to take a take a look at it and see that for us this show is a spiritual process because like all spirituality it's it's essentially water on stone so it's a slow process but whatever we output aims to always be of high quality right so spirituality is your life and it's your slow real internal life it's your inner life your real life 
And this show is a little bit of a glimpse into what's happened to us through our lives and our processes. And it happens in a very natural way, just like nature grows slowly, the show grows slowly. And it's very life changing for us in the process of making it. So, you know, thanks for, for allowing us to talk about it in that regard. I, I, we always appreciate that. We appreciate your interest and in, in resonance. And I know it, it's totally on your wavelength, Alan. And yeah, you, yeah. You, you two are definitely some of my favorites. And I, uh, I must also say that um, probably in the last couple of, of uh, months that um, <clears throat> most recently this idea that uh, the most uh, upstream or root issue um, that we face is uh, um, the remembrance of the interconnectedness, the remembrance of the one. And um, we ask that question quite a bit now on, on the show, is what is the most upstream issue that we face? And mm. I would totally agree with you. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I think we can solve any problem with our ingenuity and the technology if we understand what the problem really is. And, you know, taking a small sliver or doing geoengineering and, you know, sucking the thing out of here and it's, it, it's all interconnected. And until you understand the connection and in a sense, the, the curation of all the species and the intelligence behind that, you know, it's like the, 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 the bees spreading the, the, the pollen and the making the honey and pollinating the flowers and this interspecies symbiosis and cooperation that happens, you're going to fuck it up. But if we remember the sacred, if we remember our connection to the sacred and we realize we're not really in control, right? It's, it's the egoic separation of not feeling that connection. It's like, I, my shorthand is, it's like, essentially we're like sailboats when you put the sail up and the wind carries you, right? It's like when we try to do things, we're trying to cut through the water. We're trying to do this stuff. And it's coming from this thing which thinks it's in control. But when you let yourself be carried by the force of the intelligent, loving nature of reality, and you still have to navigate and do things, but you're guided, you're supported, you're, you're, you're part of something bigger, right? And there may be hardships, but that's part of the path. That's part of the sculpting, right? The things that are happening for you, not to you. And if we remember that, then the times that are coming, we can navigate from the heart, and we can transform. I'm not saying we're going to survive, but we can transform. And we can understand there's a greater ecology. There's a greater meaning. We come from somewhere. We go from somewhere. Don't attach to what's here now. It's always changing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the dream of life. The beautiful <sighs> dream of life. That shows us so much through our process here, right? Everything is a teaching tool and a learning tool. So that's, yeah. that's something to never forget. And... You know, to, to take it away on yeah, a positive note, I mean, I think that so much of this is um, just about greater processes, which, again, we're being shown as, as we're, we're being forced to do things in natural ways. That's what I'll say. And it's not, it's scary in the meantime, but it ultimately leads to better things. There's no, you don't improve unless you struggle. You know, your, your, your growth in life is through your struggle and your hardships. So that's what we're being shown we need to do both individually and culturally and societally. I think Niles about his POT experience. <laughs> yeah, you had, oh, because you guys did um, while it's you were... <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. funny. Through each episode, we tend to... Oh, yeah, it's different yeah. for me because Rack is an experiential journalist. Part of the process for both episodes is actually, you know, taking the sacrament and being on camera. And I'm, <laughs> as the director of the show, you know, I'm here, you know, helping him off camera and actually filming it. But then, yes, when we have spared downtime after we've essentially wrapped up our responsibility shooting, I have had the experiences and so both sh both episodes i've taken the sacraments and it's 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 been very synchronistic it's just like we say you are supported through your processes if you find your will in life and follow it it's amazing how much things up until you it doesn't mean it's not struggle it's always struggle life is life is difficult you know the spiritual path is really tough most people don't want to do it and so to um be willing to open yourself up to some of these experiences my peyote experience was beautiful and life-changing and very mm. gentle and wonderful and it's very much like a an analog to ayahuasca which is apparently very feminine it's very much a masculine guy in energy of the larger ecosystem and you know you're melting into the into the larger ecology of things brings in that unity and that oneness and that esoteric inward empowerment it's empowering it's very empowering and it's it's very educationally uplifting 
So, so let me set the scene a bit. So after three days of pilgrimage to Wirakuta, the Holy of Holy Lands, and by the way, I'd really like to emphasize as well, Wirakuta is um, endangered again by capitalism, and again by this egoic separation from understanding the sacredness of the web of life by this Canadian mining company, which is like horror of horrors, the most sacred land for thousands of years of these people that travel to take the peyote and take it back to their communities. It's endangered already and it only grows in certain geographic regions. They're mining and they made agreements with the government, etc, etc. Then they're like, wow, well, we'll just go under the ground. We won't go above the ground. And the whole, you know, interrelated being and the the, the, it pollutes and so the the the, the witch holes are fighting for the survival of their culture of their communities of their way of being because they don't just take this substance once in a peak experience they use it to mediate their energy all through the year that's why they have to have huge amounts of peyote and one of the the drain on the resources um so they take it back to the men women and children men women and children do this ceremony so you know it's 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 something which is culturally sanctioned and not just permissible but necessary for their indigenous way of life it helps them connect individually energetically and so we get to wirakuta and we're doing the filming and it's you know late at night and the Marikame Don Jose, um, they play these violins, which is so beautiful and haunting and, you know, we're like scratchy and annoying at the same time. But, yeah, beautiful but, and highlighted in the episode. Yeah, and, and, and it's, yeah. again, it's not random music. It's a certain vibrational frequency within which great spirit speaks through and energetically the vibration is healing and cleansing. And so during the day there has been the hunt for the peyote and there's prayers and rituals about how to approach that. And then we go off and there's like tumbleweeds and the desert is really full around Wirakuta with all the tumbleweeds and bushes and it's hard to look and find anything. Mm -hmm. And so then they go on the hunt and they find the peyote and you know they they dig it up and and um they start putting them in bags and they're praying and it's all very sacralized and done in a certain way with respect um and they bring back these huge bags like six foot bags you know men women and children like heaps and heaps of bags of peyote <laughs> and they they're preparing them and getting them ready for the ceremony at night and then you know we take them together the men the women and the children little bits little ones and for me i kept saying it was like a communal prayer it was like the, one of the only times you, you might go to a church in a building structure in the judo christianic sort of architecture but you're in nature you've got the incredible saturated starry sky beaming down to you and shooting stars and you've got the freezing coldness and the feeling of being alive you've got the fire which they've lit and we've gone through days of pilgrimage at the sacred water sites blessing the water that gives life blessing the land you know the open air and the fire and the fire we've done um limpias and healings and cleansings and making these little knots with our prayers to get rid of any sins especially around sexual energy or any misconducts to clean yourself to be ready enough to receive and interact with the vibrational spirit of peyote you don't just eat it right you have to approach it in a sacred way and we had the full permission of don jose and the marikames and the tribe to do so and so then we ingest the medicine with great reverence and, and gratitude and um for me and, and i i want niles to comment more as well sure. because he has this a, a great ability we noticed in episode one coming from hollywood and special effects and the audio visual side of things with technicians to describe the interior visionary scapes with this language which makes it digestible and understandable so you know for me i only had i must say it was like third day no sleep out in the middle of nowhere trying to hold it together this was a, the most demanding shoot i've ever done in my life um and i did, i just took one medium-sized pot and i lay down and I, with the you know around the fire and things and wanted to tune into the experience and again you know sometimes this happens to me with ayahuasca as well it's not necessarily visionary on that but it is heart opening yeah. and that bit where there are no barriers there's no armoring there's no separation my heart is open and feeling and connecting to the men women and children in the song and i felt like it was a communal prayer that we were singing what we were feeling and what we were feeling was connection to the mother and the planet yes. and each person was like a note in the song yeah right and when you're feeling it you're, you're riding the rhythms and the waves and it's real and you're getting it because your your aperture and your bandwidth expands and you're not 
thinking it, you're receiving the signal. And so it was like this incredibly sacred, beautiful communal prayer that we did as a community for ourselves, for the planet, for Pachamama and for Great Spirit. And it, it, was, it was just a real sacralizing game changer for me in the way I actually see shamanism beyond just even the plant medicines mm. in the community, in the relationships, in the sacrifice and in the spirituality. Well, with what you just said and the elements, you know, giving that to you, you're not going to want to commodify them very much, are you then? Like yeah. compared to what our culture does and to just get, you know, a little yeah. controversial and funny about that. I was recently in Alabama at a wedding at a mega church. Little did I know it would be at a mega church. And I'm at this place thinking this is just a completely despiritualized place. This is a very hierarchical, political, patriarchal, you know, very political and like something that has had essentially been despiritualized because it's just a big money making machine versus being in somewhere like Waracuda through this indigenous tribal experience of a true shamanic spiritual experience that unions you with nature's greatest ecology, right? So you're taking in the sacrament that then gives you an insight as to expansion of what Waracuda, Mexico looks like from the five senses. You know, you can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it. But then the peyote experience is kind of uploading you to the larger ecology of it, which has a completely different fabric to it. And my experience was not only, yes, heart opening, where you melt into the all of it, you see the Waracuda jungle in this kind of very hyper accentuated, you know, Tron landscape of this little, these little puppet figures of the, the cactuses come alive and are shimmering and moving and giving insights. And each branch of them is a spirit that's melting onto you and giving you this kind of fractal holography of a bleed through of information and data, right? And all this stuff is coming from nature. So again, when you have these wonderful heart opening, mind expanding, consciousness expanding experiences through a true Eucharist, not just some cold cup that has some apparently exoteric half-truth of a body of maybe what was once a corporeal being, you're actually seeing a real direct connection with nature's spiritual teachings. Nature is the spiritual teacher who happens to be just distributing this through a mesh network of, yes, plants and animals and other ways that you can do it through pranayama, breathing, meditation, other ways that you can access it. Of course, what's so beautiful about shamanism is, the, is how fast things can be experienced and how life-changing things can be in one night. That's a beautiful thing. And that makes you less controllable, less on puppet strings, more empowered, which is kind of terrifying to untruth ways of doing things, right? So as we move from truth to untruth, that's something that I highlight through an experience that is just so cherishing. And all my shamanic experiences that have come through this, primarily, primarily through the show in other ways, and I think we all feel this way, are you take with them and you cherish them forever. And they're very life-changing. And you use them in your larger spiritual journey as stepping stones along the way to better your life. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> you can come with us next episode. Um. Yeah, it'd be fun to have you, man. You know, we'd always love to have guests. Huh? I would adore that. And just like Peru. this, just like this. Wow. Yeah, man. Peru. I would adore that. Just like this show, you know, we would do these, we would do these whether or not we were documenting them or not. So I'd, I'd like to have this conversation with you whether or not it's being recorded. You know, same with the show. It's like we do it anyway. And it's nice because it obviously, like I mentioned at the beginning, it utilizes our skill set and we do make something that is a nice piece of our portfolio. But um, it's, it's the experience of it. It's the process of doing it. That is the journey. You know, life's about the journey. And one last thing I'd like to say as well, that global shamanic resurgence phrase, you know, resurgence was chosen specifically because it's not new, right? It's yeah. come before. Yeah. But there is this momentum now in what we call the West or, or the modern world to remember the, the sacred connection with nature and to remember the intelligence and the love and, and the, what it's all about and what we're in. And previous cultures have had this. You know, we talked a little bit at the start about indigenous tribal cultures and poor and all this stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. that's what we've done to them. Right. You know, previous yeah. cultures on the earth have been shamanic cultures which used entheogens. There's the, the city of Chavin, which was a, in South America, which was a shamanic culture which used potentially DMT snuffs and San Pedro cactus and uh, probably ayahuasca. And there's every culture, like great grand civilizations, 
you know, all through South America. I listened to some podcast recently. It was like in the 1500s when some of the first Spanish explorers went through. They reported cities of gold up and down the Amazon. And they found out with, with um, LIDAR, with the new um, laser technology to see through the jungles, they found like, you know, 700 cities, all the, the, the remnants. And they yeah. say they were, they were up to like 70,000 people each. So there have been grand civilizations that have existed, that have existed in and with nature, even in the city schematic, with an entheogenic component that enables them to connect to nature. And they, we don't have to necessarily give up anything except our expectations, right? We don't have to give up like going back to the jungles or going back to nature and becoming cavemen. No one's saying that. But there's a potential through the healing of the mediation of plant medicines and the shamanic resurgence to remember who and what we really are, to remember the connection to the planet and to take an organic, holistic, um, life-affirming way to approach the world. And I'm seeing this in a lot of the new paradigm stuff, all the, you know, um, uh, renewable technologies, the solar, the wind, you know, all the ways that we can capture the energy that's already there to fuel our civilization yeah. in healthy, clean, you know, zero emission ways. Um, and we can build a galactic civilization, Alan, again, yeah, yeah. as these ones used to have. Yeah, and and I, I think that this, this global shamanic resurgence thing, it's not... It's, it's, it's nothing small, it's a great endeavor, but it's something which is being catalyzed by larger forces. And it's about that unification. So imagine 100 years from now, we're all living in a jungle that covers the planet. We're all living in, in, in um, abundance and we're all living in love and community with a technology that's embedded into the ecology and is part of the ecology. Yes, yes. And, you know, it has survived the transformation of the sixth great species extinction and become something new that it was always within it to be that goes through those cycles of time and has come out the other side. So that, that's why I believe the resurgence is nothing new, um, but it has an energetic, impetuous and uh, catalyzation to it, which is really necessary at this time in, in, in species evolution. Yeah, and speaking of evolution and de-evolution, it seems like, you know, larger energetic and galactic forces forcing, forcing us to go through spiritual processes may be leading us to ways of living more authentically through consciousness expansion, right? And we see aspects of society which sometimes feels like most people seem to be de-evolving. Maybe those, they will eventually, you know, recede into the forgotten shadows of time. And through cycles of time, we see civilizations rise and fall that are much more conscious societies, right? And we look at things from the past that obviously had technologies that we don't have now, such as great relics that were built in very amazing, magical ways. And it shows societies that were much more expanded in their ways of living and being and acting and how they found harmony within themselves and their larger ecology and connectedness with everything. So that those, those I look at something like, you know, the pyramids as, as proof that society has, has been around the blocks for a long time. And we've done things in very interesting ways. And have you had Graham Hancock on the show? Because you really should. <laughs> oh my God, we've, he's amazing. We've Ancient messaged, civilizations. We've messaged him. We've yeah. messaged him. Um, There's a lot of proof of, out there. That's what I mentioned. There's this a lot is of, actually yeah. actually one of the things that when you mentioned it, it's um it's come up uh, a lot on 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 the program now is that um this species amnesia um, we uh, uh, have we think that all of the existing. Um, W w wisdom that we have from the last 500 years post enlightenment and industrial revolution today mm -hmm. this 0.1% of all history this 99.9% um, has a lot that can teach us and one of the great problems of our time is that we can't actually do the archaeology fast enough as the artifacts are disintegrating so we mm -hmm. need to um, create a massive uh, global task force on archaeology in specific places, especially the Fertile Crescent, the Amazon, all of these uh, cl coastal cliff regions as well around the planet hmm. to uncover. I mean, there's if, if you follow archaeology as one of your news trends instead of the it, instead of that nastiness of the of the of the fighting of the two polarized sides, mm. that stuff's killing you. But if you follow archaeology as one of your news sources, 
the amount of discoveries mm. that are happening every day the paradigms being re rewritten rewritten yeah. as as we go and so that's one of the most important things is when you you know when you look up at the cosmos the same thing is happening where we are not mapping continuously our cosmos and therefore we're not doing the cosmic archaeology where if we go through supernovas in different places through the cosmos we are not actually able to capture that moment and log it and understand it happening in that area so it's very similar with our species as well of discovering these moments um, of our uh, amnesia but this entire um, conversation uh, I think uh, as well as these other most profound guests and conversations that we have on the program all point to the interconnectedness they all point to non-separation they all point to the one and they all point to that with to these wisdoms that come from this 99.9% .9 of time pre-enlightenment industrial revolution where by understanding those wisdoms that we can architect a more prosperous isn't it, isn't it ironic they call it the enlightenment I mean, having had enlightenment experiences, I'm like, you know, the, the mechanistic reductionist success of rising civilization up out of poverty and all the things to a certain degree, but that's not enlightenment, you know? That's mechanistic success. Mm. Uh, but I think enlightenment is really coming. It's still coming. It comes and yeah. it goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's coming Cycles. back. This Everything is, is secular. This yeah. is the most beautiful I've never ever felt anything more beautiful than what we are all experiencing oh great it's, it's yeah. um it's really yeah. come with us for episode three <laughs> huh? huh yeah i love you guys both so much um and i mean this reality this um this creation is just and so that is uh it's a miracle a, yeah. it's a gift that's why they call it the present right <laughs> Um, but it is. It's like we get desensitized. We wake up, we hit the thing, we go to work, you know. And I've seen you. I've seen you grow over the course of many episodes. And you thank have. you for having us back. You and have, I see yeah. you on the Facebook feeds and, and your, um, your language and your perception and what you choose to give attention to has a depth to it that it didn't say two years ago when I Definitely. first came oh, yeah. on the show. Definitely. And so, you know, before we started, we did a little drop in, a little breathing exercise. And as you said, it's like savoring each moment. The awareness of awareness is what we're really cultivating over many lifetimes. And if we can become aware enough to not take it personally, yeah. to not attach, to not have aversion or grasping, to be the ing that is great, then I think we've got it and the enlightenment will come. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Powerful. Adore you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. I love you. Plug our show again. I love you guys. It's coming. It's coming. Trust me. It's coming. Plug the it's show. Coming. Also, please, please show these one more time oh, to yeah. the... Um, so they, these are beat artworks. They they do. Um, let's do racks first. They so do little ahead. figures, but they also make the armbands. So here's the thing: each bead is individually placed into the armband in this instance, and theoretically, each bead what they're doing is a meditation and a prayer. So this represents some of the energy signature patterns that you can see, for instance, on each on, bead is a meditation and a prayer. Yeah, each because one. the process of doing it is like a meditation, but it's yeah. bringing them into mindfulness yes. and it's like a prayer and it's anchoring on the outside for others to see what they see on the exactly. inside exactly. with their sacrament yeah. of the peyote. And it's another beautiful example of somebody making something cottage industry style from a creative standpoint, right? It's yeah. like you're not making this by some massive centralized hierarchical yeah. top-down yes, structure yes, making yes. it from a like little woman who, yes, in a village who makes yes. beautiful art so so much of reality and, and the ways of getting back to authentic authenticity are from the bottom up you know yeah. from grassroots yes, ways yes, yes, right yes. so beautiful so, so I know you're asking the, the show will be out in the spring <laughs> episode two <laughs> Ep episode two spring 2020 mm -hmm. again watch episode one of shamans of the global village the link is in the bio below if you haven't seen it yet go watch it we are so grateful that you tuned into this conversation thank you very much everyone greatly appreciate you 
have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the subjects that Niles and Rack talked about in this episode with us, please, please, please drop into those states of interconnectedness, of love, drop in more together into the one and catalyze that through even the most simple things like the breath and the water and the food, the most simple ones. Also support the work that Niles and Rack do. You can find the links below to support them and the work as well. Again, it's very important to support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders in your communities and around the world that you believe in and support them. Support them financially, even with the small cup of coffee or meal per month um, helps them. If around the world we did that for the subscribers that tune into content, we could catalyze the awakening faster so do support them financially as well support the ones also in your communities you can find our links below to our show as well paypal patreon cryptocurrency all those links are below and go and build that future that our hearts all know is possible we love you very much thank you for tuning in we'll see you soon